Hello everyone. <clears throat> we'll be reading again today from the my book, Murder in the Cold Hill. We're up to chapter 14. Hope everybody is healthy. Let's continue. Chapter 14, Michigassen. We were sitting at Jumping Jack Slatterly's desk at the East Lansing Police Station filing a report about the car explosion. The state police were going to be officially in charge of the investigation because of the use of explosives. In addition, if it indeed turned out to be a grenade, and I'm sure it was, the feds would get into the action. Now, I'm really get, now I really am pissed, I said. Jumping Jack said, I understand completely. Someone is out to kill you, and you just lost a new car. It's not that. The car was insured. I'm pissed because the state police hauled away the vehicle to their lab and they wouldn't let me take out the lunch hamper. I lost a great lunch, I said. Daphna added in the case file and your laptop and the pictures. I suddenly realized something else and my Talis and Tefillin. They were in there too, I said with concern. Don't worry, said Slatterly. I'll call the state guys and get the stuff back to you in a couple of days. What would I use for tomorrow morning's prayer services? Yeah, but I need them now. Well, we'll make you another file. It will only take a couple of minutes, said Slatterly. There was no reason that Jumping Jack would understand my concern, but Daphna apparently did. She said, I'll lend you my husband's filling. They're just sitting at home in a drawer. That was something very personal. I was moved. Thank you. Hey, you saved my life. The least I can do is lend you a tefillin, she said with a smile. I had to say that Daphna was holding up pretty well. I saw how she handled herself yesterday after the mugging, and now after the explosion. Gutsy lady. Slatterly asked, when and where do you think they were able to rig the grenade? The car was parked in the motel parking lot all night. That's when I would have done it, I said. So who knew you were staying at the Marriott, the cop inquired. Well, the FNAF course, Rebbe Lipsky and Rebbe Klein. I think that's about it, I said. So that makes all of them suspects, said Slatterly. Daphna was shaking her head from side to side. I'm afraid it is not that simple, she said. Why not? Who else knew I was staying at the Marriott, I asked. Well, just about everyone that has any, anything to do with the Kolo, she answered. How do you know, I asked. Because last night, just about everybody that has anything to do with the Kolo called me to find out about the mugging. They all knew about my kicking someone in the um, private parts. And they all knew about you and your investigation, and they knew that you were staying at the Marriott. I was confused. Who told them? My mother. She cooks, cleans, teaches, and takes care of the house, and is the official busybody of the East Lansing Coilel. I even got a call from Rebetzin Kalmanovis. I looked at Slatter and said, that means that everybody west of Detroit is a suspect. You know, I should run you out of town like the sheriffs used to do in the Wild West at Jumping Jack. You're a regular crime wave. First the attempted armed robbery, now the car bombing. What's going on with you? Whose toes did you step on? Somebody sure doesn't like me, but who and why? So far, other than the stuff we told Julie this morning, we have come up with Zip. Why would someone want to kill me? Maybe that's nothing to do with the case, ventured Daphna. What do you mean, I asked. Well, you're a cop for 15 years and a private investigator for two. You must have made enemies along the way. Maybe it's just playback time, said Daphna, proud of her reasoning. You could be right, I said, and then paused to look at the, at the proud smile on Daphna's face. But the odds are that you're not. Her smile faded considerably. If we're talking about an enemy of mine from 15 years ago, why did he wait so long for payback? And why come all the way out to Lansing? I don't work in this area, and that means neither do, that, do my old enemies. It's just so much more likely that there's a new enemy, someone from this case. So Slattery's question is a good one. Whose toes did we step on? And what the hell did we uncover that was so secret that even we don't know what we that we uncovered it? Daphne asked, if the bomb was really a grenade, can't the police track down whoever placed it? You can't buy grenades in a grocery store. Honey, you are so wrong, said Slatterly. Maybe you can't buy them in a grocery store, but you can get as many as you want down in Detroit. You live in the Appleby house, don't you? Slatterly asked Daphna. Yes, we bought the house from Mr. Appleby, she answered. He was one hell of a screwed up prepper, said Jumping Jack with a laugh. 
told everyone who would listen that we will be facing Armageddon any day now. You'll find, you find any of his old prepper pals, and they'll be able to supply you with hand grenades, anti-personnel mines, bazookas, even cannons. They're all nuts. That whole group is a regular underground army surplus supermarket. So to answer your question, just because you know it was a grenade, and even if we are able to find out where and when it was stolen from the military, does not mean that the state police will be able to find who planted the bomb. So you're just going to accept this, asked an agitated Daphna? Someone tried to kill you and me, and you're not going to do anything? Take it easy, I said, trying to calm her. Getting angry is not going to help. Look at the bright side of things. What bright side, she asked in exasperation. If someone tried to kill us and is connected to this case, then we must be doing something right. Someone thinks we're getting too close for comfort and wants us out of the way, I answered. Slattery, uh, too, bad, too bad you guys haven't the foggiest idea what you might have discovered. There is that, I said. Did you have to rub it in? Can't we just fool ourselves to think that we are super duper sleuths? Oh yeah, you guys are definitely super sleuths. I told the squad to pay attention to how you work so they can learn from you, said the cop, sarcastically. <clears throat> Very funny, I said with a grin. Listen, super cop. Someone is considering doing you bodily harm. I know you, ha you have a carry license. Are you packing? I left my piece in Detroit. I did not think I needed a weapon, I answered. I can lend you something. Really? It would make me feel better, said Slatterly. Is it going to give you a gun? Asked Daphne eagerly. Take it easy, Annie Oakley, I told her. I'm, I turned to Jumping Jack and said, thanks for the offer. If I think a gun is necessary, I'll take you up on it. Take the gun, said Daphne. I don't want you anywhere near firearms. No guns, I insisted. Let me see if the new copy of the case file is ready yet, said Slatterly as he left his desk to head for the copy machine. What do we do now, she asked. Well, we get the case file and then we wait for the loaner car from the insurance company, I said. When I called the agency, that damn agent had the nerve to say that he was not sure if my car was covered for getting blown up by a bomb. He only agreed to the loaner car when I threatened to go up to his office and rab an M67 grenade up his tuchus. Slattery turned and threw a cardboard file on the table. Here's the case file. Try not to get this one blown up, he said with a complacent smile. Do you need a ride anywhere? No, there's a loaner on the way. I don't know what's going on, but now I am also getting a gut feeling there may, there may be something to <clears throat> Rabbi Klein's death, and it maybe it was not a simple suicide, said Slattery. That means if someone did kill the rabbi, they're pretty shrewd. They think they got away with it. I hate that. I haven't got a shred of evidence to support my feeling, so I'm going to look at everything over and over again. I want the bastard. If you find anything, bring it to me. If you had cooperation up to Wazoo before, now you're going to get, get it up to Super Wazoo. Daphna and I were waiting just inside the main doors of the station. The agent said the car was on the way, but so far nothing in sight. She was scro scrolling through messages on her phone, and you could not tell that only a few hours ago she had almost been blown to bits. Mrs. Daphna Lachler was an interesting lady. What makes her tick? Has your mother always lived with you, I asked? Well, actually, no, just the past two years. My, di my dad died suddenly about half a year before David. My, my mom was just shuffling around her big house in New York and when David died. We knew I would need help with the girls, so she rented out her house and moved in with us. The arrangement is terrific. Since there's no Jewish school in the area, we've been homeschooling the girls. And mom is an experienced teacher. She cooks, cleans, teaches, and cares for the girls. She loves it, and the girls love her. And for me, it couldn't be better. Especially the part where you, it allows you to go off gallivanting around in an attempt to fulfill a childish wish to become a detective and almost getting yourself blown up, I said with a smile. Didn't I say it couldn't be better? Am I asking one more question? Sure, we're partners. That's what Kiktokas partners are for. Just about everywhere I've been in the ultra from world, the separation between men and women is just about total. Now, I'm not saying that I don't enjoy your company, but how is it that you're allowed to be driving around with me and even sit with me? You mean all alone, like in a car, she added? Yeah, in a car. A parked car sometimes? Exactly, I said. Okay, fair question, she began. David once explained his ideas on this subject. 
What he said was that the whole men and women separation issue is based on a 2,000-year-old conceptual argument between Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Meir, two of the greatest Talmudic sages. You, you've heard of them, haven't you? Of course I answered. Even I have heard of them. They both knew that there is a physical attraction between men and women, and this can lead to all sorts of hanky-panky, if you know what I mean. I know what you mean. Rabbi Akiva appreciated the attractiveness of women and even encouraged it, but he taught that a man must overcome any tendencies he had for indulging in hanky-panky. Rabbi Meir, who was Rabbi Akiva's student, felt it was a lost cause. Once a man got a look at an attractive woman, there was no way he was not going to indulge in hanky-panky. His recommendation was that whenever women were in a situation where there were men that were not their husbands present, they had to cover up all that made them beautiful and attractive. You know, hair coverings, wigs, modest clothing. Better yet, they should never be in the company of men who were not their husbands. Possibly one of the factors that influenced Rav Mayer was a bitter experience he had in this matter. His super intelligent wife committed adultery with one of the students in the yeshiva. So Rabbi Akiva's rule for men is look, but don't touch. And Rabbi Meir's rule for men is don't look. And for women, his rule is don't allow the men to look. The firm world leans towards Rabbi Meir's ruling. But you have been riding around with me for two days, I stated. Well, I'll get to that, she said, holding up an index finger. You have to realize I am not your normal from woman. I was raised in what is called a modern orthodox home. Many modern orthodox women do not cover their hair. I went to mixed youth groups, meaning boys and girls together. I was raised to know that a female can have male friends and vice versa without there being unremitting orgies or hanky-panky. I met David and was swept off my feet, and then he swept me into the more stringent world, firm world of Detroit. It was quite foreign for me at first. I was 18 when I married. Wow, so young, even younger than I was. Your parents were happy with that? Well, they did not have much to say about it. So you never went to college? Well, actually, I was in a special PhD program at the University of Michigan when I met David. At age 17? Uh, no, I, I was 16. 16, PhD? I was a precocious kid, she said with a modest shrug of her shoulders. Where were your parents? Back in New York, it was a perfect arrangement. We were here, and they were in New York. They got along perfectly. Yeah, I can see how that would be. That would help. Rebson Kamalevich was my savior. She helped me adapt to this strange new world that I was suddenly forced to live in. I also started my computer business, and that required even more adaptation. Looks like you did all right. Yes and no, she said, flapping her hand back and forth. It was more like 50% I adapted, and 50% they just tolerated my Michigan. Mishingasen was another expression I knew. Mishuga meant crazy, loony, off the wall. Mishingasen meant the expression of that craziness, strangeness or weirdness. People were always using that expression when they referred to me. For what I've seen, the Fum are not that tolerant, I commented. Yeah, they are. You just have to know how to play the game. Sort of like, if you're crazy, they understand when you do strange stuff. After all, you're nuts. What do you expect? I get it. They say she's modern orthodox. She doesn't know any better. Sort of, she said, rocking, rocking her head from side to side. And that is why you get to sit in a car with a man who is not your husband. And that's only part of it. The main reason is because we are both unattached and prime wedding fodder. You know that expression that nature abhors a vacuum? Well, the Jewish community abhors unattached Jewish singles. Everyone is trying to match me off. So you date often. I said they try. But the greater Lansing area is not rife with prime candidates to not make an appropriate shidduch. So they will tolerate us sitting in the car because all of the entes, the, the rumor mongers, my mother included, are hoping that our little partnership turns into something more permanent. Is she flirting with me? Can't be. It would not be a bad thing. I'm actually having a good time. Well, concentrate. You're on a case. No time for distractions. I tried to turn to what we were saying, and that is why you do not cover your hair like all the other from women. Dafna cocked her head to the side and asked, You think I don't cover my hair? Well, yeah, I said, looking at her long blonde ponytail. Thanks for the compliment, she said, fingering her ponytail. This is a shaitl. 
holy cow, it was a wig. I never would have guessed. I had no idea. Just shows you. It pays to get good quality. I could have sworn you were a natural blonde, I said in surprise. Actually, this is my hair color. It's just not my own hair. Oh, it's really nice, I said, com complimenting her. Thank you, but as a yeshiva bacher, you really shouldn't have noticed. I know, but I, I could not help myself. What did I just say? Am I flirting with the fna? How inappropriate. I have to watch myself. End of chapter 14. We'll get to chapter 15 next. Thank you for listening.